Love it. All right. So now here's where we're at. This is the overview. So here's your brake booster. The right side is inside the car. Here's your master cylinder. That's obviously outside the car. This right here is what your brake pedal hooks to. So when you guys are applying the brakes, you're going to be pushing on this push rod. But this push rod is really just controlling this valve. See, they call it the pop it valve. That's essentially what you're doing when you control the brake pedal. But like I had explained before, when you press on the brake pedal, you're not only controlling the valve, let's say that the engine's off or the engine doesn't make adequate vacuum, this push rod will ram into this push rod, which will push into the master cylinder. So even if your brake booster is not working, you can see in this line right here, there's still a way that your brake pedal will apply the primary piston of the master cylinder, even if the brake booster fails. So it's safe, um, but after this poppet valve, we come in here and, and right, right around here, this is the diaphragm. So if we push you know, on this, on this input uh, push rod, we're either going to push directly on the diaphragm or more than likely what's going to be occurring if the engine's running. Right here, this, this is all the vacuum chamber. They'll call the brake booster chamber. This would actually apply vacuum on that diaphragm and draw it over here to the left. As it draws the diaphragm to the left, you can see this push rod is going to push harder and harder into the brake master cylinder, primary piston, and then the secondary piston. So right here is where our vacuum chamber is. You also kind of know it's the vacuum chamber because if you look, it's got the vacuum hose going into that chamber. So this is where a lot of the magic happens. Um, this spring right here, so, so let's say you press the brake pedal and then you go to let go of the brake pedal. This is essentially a big return spring. So you, the brake booster has to fight that return spring to apply it. But then once you release the brakes, that return spring is actually going to push your pedal back up. So that's an important spring. And then if you look at the hose, picture over here is your engine. So if your engine's over here and it's making all the suction, it's drawing air out and down the hose. And that's fine. And then we had kind of discussed that that could be your intake manifold due to the piston coming down. Or that could be like on a modern vehicle, that could be the engine driven vacuum pump. So this is going to go to whatever the source is, whether it's the intake manifold or a, an engine driven vacuum pump. Problem is, especially with the with the uh, actual intake manifold style, you're going to shut the engine off, turn it off, and then air rushes in the throttle body, rushes into the intake, rushes up this hose. If that check valve is no good, it's going to immediately wipe out all the vacuum that's in there, and you have no assist. So, so that's the purpose of the check valve right there. You shut the engine off. It should block air from rushing in. It should maintain this amount of vacuum right here for the you know couple good pedal applications. So there's your overview. Now we'll get more into the details, like what we were trying to do. So here is the check valve as you see it right there. You can tell because the vacuum hose is going to it. That can be set in a grommet. The grommet would be the seal to the to the booster. Or like in this case, the check valve is actually in line right in the hose. Does the same job. Um, and like I was explaining, if the check valve is bad, it needs a check valve. And if the booster is bad, well, it may need it may have a problem with the constant pressure chamber. It may have a problem with the piston return spring, the brake booster piston, the reaction disc, the control valve assembly, something up with the uh, the pedal push rod or the master cylinder push rod, but but essentially what you just really need to know is just the function, how all these things function. And then as mentioned, if let's say we have a problem with the diaphragm, we're not going to take the brake booster apart and replace the diaphragm. That's not what we do. We're never going to do that. There are specialty shops that do that, but those are the, like the brake booster 
remanufacturing shops. They just rebuild brake boosters. They don't work on cars. Let's say that it's the same. It's the problem with the control valve. We don't, again, we don't even really need to know it's a control valve. All you need to know is, is the problem the brake booster? And if it's, if it's any one of these things in the brake booster, we're replacing the brake booster and then we're good. We don't exactly care what the details are. And so I'll go a little bit more into, into how you know what it is. So this is where we were, control valve operation. Remember, that's this valve right here. So this valve that when you press on the brake pedal, you're controlling this little flap door. So it, it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. But this helps you understand how it works. So let's say your brake pedal's released, right? Brake's not applied. Engine vacuum is going to draw on both the right side of this orange diaphragm or the booster piston and the left side. So now this question should be something you could answer. If we have 21 inches of mercury of vacuum on the right and 21 inches of mercury of vacuum on the left, where's that brake booster piston, AKA the diaphragm moving? Nowhere, you got it. So it's just gonna sit there, it's not gonna do anything until let's say we apply the brakes. Now look what happens. When we apply the brakes, we open up this air valve that's the control valve right there. We open that up. Look what happens. Atmospheric pressure rushes in, backfills the left side of the diaphragm or the booster piston. And now we have, essentially we have atmospheric pressure, but we're going to make it really simple. We're going to make this gauge zero, which is zero PSI. We have zero PSI and we have negative 10 PSI. Essentially, we have a massive pressure difference. And can you see how that's going to push your booster piston to the right? As it pushes it to the right, the push rod is pushing on the master cylinder. You guys can see how that's going to apply the master cylinder piston. But we'll go into a little bit more detail here. Those numbers are pretty close. Zero PSI on the left, 10 PSI on the right. But that's... Uh, negative 10 PSI, I should say. Sorry, that's suction, right? It's vacuum. So if we have negative 10 pounds per square inch, which is PSI, then we look at the size of that brake booster diaphragm or the piston. And this is where it was getting a little bit weird, but let's say it's a 10 inch booster piston. It's round. If it was square, it'd be 10 by 10, that'd be 100 square inches. But it's round, so we'd actually need uh, pi r squared. So we'd need the pi 3.1415 if you want. And then the radius of, a, of an eight inch booster would be four, and then we'd have to square it. So the math gets a little bit, a little bit, it's not, it's not really hard math, but this is the concept. If you have an eight inch uh, booster, uh, a 10 inch um, booster diaphragm, it probably has about 80 inches of surface area. So you have your negative 10 inches and your zero inches. That gives you a 10 pounds per square inch difference times 80 inches of, of actual surface area. That would be 800 pounds of force generated by the booster. So you guys kind of get that, right? But that all depends on this valve. So when we step on this valve, Atmospheric pressure has to rush in, and that also depends on the engine building adequate vacuum. So if your engine is not running well and your engine's only making uh, 10 inches of mercury, that'd only be like 5 PSI, you're only going to get, say, 400 pounds of force, not 800 pounds of force. So the health of your engine and the and the, uh, the fact that you have a good hose with no major vacuum leaks, that's all going to affect how the brake pedal feels. So if you can visualize you have 800 pounds of force, that pedal is going to be nice and easy. If you have a vacuum hose that's collapsed, you have zero pounds of force. You're not getting any assist. That, that pedal is going to be very firm.
or let's say you have somewhere in between, you have a bunch of leaks in that hose, that hose is kind of loose, kind of sloppy, maybe cracks. The engine's making 20 inches of mercury, but only 10 inches of mercury are really being applied to the booster because all the various leaks, you may only get the 400 pounds of assist. That pedal's going to be a little more firm, not totally firm, but, but it's not going to give you as much assist as it should. That's going to increase your stopping distance, and that's where you know NHTSA certified the vehicle under good operating conditions. That car is not going to stop right. That's a no-go. So that, there's your control valve. This is like just a cartoon illustration of how it works. You definitely have to understand that. And then here's a little bit more on how the valve specifically works. So right here, that's the, that's the push rod. This goes to your pedal, right? And if we had no vacuum, we could actually push this push rod right up against this reaction disc. And the reaction disc would actually push on the brake input piston, the brake uh, master cylinder piston. But let's say like in this case, brakes are not applied. Look, we apply the brakes now, but this is when we just start to apply the brakes. So let me back up. Not applied, we just start to apply. Not applied, we just start to apply. Not applied, just start to apply. But as you can see, it hasn't necessarily uh, rushed the air in yet. So now as we apply some more, check out that difference. Not applied, starting to apply, applied, air actually rushes in. And there is a filter right here. See the air cleaner element? Air is going to rush in. There's going to be a whoosh sound. Then that air is going to come down into these other passages. And that's when we get that pressure differential of zero PSI and negative 10 PSI. And that's when it's actually going to do the work, right? So progression over time. Released, starting to apply, applied so the air rushes in. See, right here, there's a valve and a seat. Here it's seated. Air doesn't rush in. Here it's unseated. Air rushes in. So that's all part of what the valve does. And then when we uh, release, that's when we're actually going to seal that valve off. And then we're going to get vacuum on both sides again. And then that return spring further over in the booster is going to center us back up. And that'll ultimately result in releasing the brakes. So here's an example of a failure. Let's say we had the engine died or no vacuum or the we capped the hose or whatever reason we don't have vacuum. You can still see it. It will still function. So if we step on this, this push rod rams the reaction disc. Reaction disc actually pushes the brake uh, booster push rod, which pushes the master cylinder piston just with no assist is all. right. And then here's an example of a tandem. I didn't have access to uh, a tandem on the trainer, but I did show it on that Honda Pilot. So this Honda Pilot's not a real big vehicle, but remember, like I was saying, to Honda, when they first came out with that, that's the biggest vehicle they'd ever made at, at that time. So they went ahead and they did a tandem booster. Here's a diaphragm and piston, and here's another diaphragm and piston. So let's say that booster was, we'll, we'll make it the same. Let's make it a 10-inch booster. Most of the time, they wouldn't be, by the way. Rather than a big 10-inch booster, they're going to shrink it down to a smaller booster. It's mostly for, it's mostly for additional um, stopping power with smaller space. You know, so that it's to save space while still getting a good amount of assist. But let's say it was a 10 inch and you had two diaphragms. You don't have 800 square inches. You have 1600 square inches because you got double the surface area. So these can be very powerful. Probably what they'd more than likely do is not make it an eight, but not make it a 10. They may make it an eight. So if you have two eights, you're maybe looking at 1300. It's still a lot, but the booster itself will be a little deeper but quite a bit smaller in diameter. So that's the way it works. Uh, actually, it works pretty much the same, except there's going to be vacuum on. It's basically just like two combined. So there's vacuum on the left and the right, and which the right becomes the left of the second uh, diaphragm. So it's pretty much the same. And then when we apply it, if you look, the vacuum is going to rush not only to the right of the first diaphragm, but also it's going to be ported in to the right of the second diaphragm. So we're getting double the effect. 
and see kind of that work. The way we diagnose it, exactly the same. The way we replace it, exactly the same. It's just technically it's slightly different technology, so it's something that we cover at least briefly. And then this is something that's Toyota specific um, that we don't really see anymore. But if an older vehicle comes in with it, I don't want you to be totally lost. So what what they did when, especially like when the first um, Sequoia came out, they were like, oh, Toyota's making a big SUV now. And it was on some of the Tundras too. But they basically do the booster and then they add this third chamber they call the brake pressure conversion unit and then the master cylinder. So they've, it's almost like having a master cylinder before the master cylinder. This is its own assembly. It doesn't come with the booster. It doesn't come with the master cylinder. It's its own standalone piece. So essentially how it works, we're going to, this is the reaction disc from the booster. So the booster makes its pressure assist. So it makes it 800 PSI or 800, 800 pounds, I should say. And that 800 pounds is going to be applied to this piston. And if you look, there's going to be a, there's going to be a, a size difference in this chamber. So we can actually increase our force because this chamber is larger. Then we're going to, you know, kind of with Pascal's law, we go back to hydraulics. This is more of a hydraulic component, but it functions as a booster. So it's kind of weird, but because we're using Pascal's law, which is let's say we have a one inch piston and we go to a two, in, two square inch piston, we can double our force, but it'll cost us half our distance we can double the force applied to the master cylinder input piston as well. So this is just a way to get even more force on that system. So the booster works with vacuum. This is simple hydraulics and the master cylinder is simple hydraulics. So in the case you see something that looks weird, it's actually possible it could be a brake pressure conversion unit on some of those um, earlier Tundras and Sequoias. So this is pretty much how it works as you can see. And this one's piped into the brake master cylinder reservoir. So it's literally like a pre-master cylinder. Um, now, diagnosing, which you've done, and I showed you passes and fails, but this is summarization. So you can learn by reflecting on what you've learned and, and learn even more. You're polishing the details of what you kind of know. So let's say we're going to do the booster operation, the function test, what I like to call it. Jump in the car, engine off, pump the pedal several times, and the pedal is going to get firm. We agree on that. You're going to hold the firm pedal. You're going to start the engine. What should happen? And the pedal should sink a little bit. And that's because the booster got the vacuum it needed when the engine started. The booster took the vacuum, applied the negative 10 PSI, you step on the pedal already, right? So air rushes in, atmospheric pressure, and you get that pressure differential. And next thing you know, your leg was kind of scrawny. Your weak, sad, lame leg. Basically, I'm going to name you like uh, Helga. Just weak. I don't know if you guys have seen Hey Arnold, but Helga from Hey Arnold, little scrawny blonde girl. She's Helga, right? She pushes. Nothing happens. And then all of a sudden, Helga becomes Olga. And Olga is like the trench bull from, from uh, what's the movie? Madeline, what, what the heck is it called? Matilda. There you go. The trench bull is in there. Well, that's Olga. So the booster essentially takes little Helga and, and makes Helga into Olga. And when Olga steps in, we press the pedal down. It's all due to the booster. It's true. This is all scientific. It's all it's scientific. So that negative 10 PSI and zero PSI, all of a sudden, boom, you get your 800 pounds of assist. And then you're like, oh, yeah, the pedal dropped. Cool. All you're doing is you're just making sure that you did, in fact, get that 800 pounds of assist. Plus or minus. If you didn't, though, if you didn't, now you need to know how to proceed with the diagnosis of why you didn't. If you, if you get it and it works, it works, you're done. 
It doesn't, then that's when we get into some of the stuff we did in lab. Checking the source of vacuum. Is the booster getting the source it needs? If it's not getting the source it needs, where is it losing the vacuum? Is the engine not making enough vacuum? Is, does it have a vacuum leak, et cetera? So it's a little summary. And then the other one that was uh, something I find that people struggle a little bit more with is the tightness check. So that's, right, you're going you're gonna to roll up to the car with it running, leave it running, run it for one to two minutes. I think that's kind of excessive. I'd probably do about 30 seconds, but go ahead, by all means. And then, and at that point, you know, you're basically doing a function test. Then you're literally just going to turn it off and you could do two different things. When you turn it off, you should feel if your brake pedal comes back up, it's not holding. What this one is more saying is, when you run it, you it should it should drop to the floor quite a bit, and when you shut it off, it should stay a little. It it should you should still be able to get a little bit of a of a of a lower pedal, but if it immediately goes to like this short stroke, that would be it's not holding. There's a couple ways to do it. This is the Toyota specified way. I probably would do it slightly different. Um, and so we'll, we'll go to the the way that I would do it in just a little bit. Now, here's a precaution too. Um, if you haven't done the booster or the master cylinder yet, you definitely want to take a note right here. What has happened in the past, you go to remove the master cylinder, but there's still vacuum in the booster. You pull on the master cylinder, the vacuum on the booster is still basically sucking on the piston. And then you go pull the master cylinder out, the piston pops right out the backside, the piston falls inside the booster. Now you got to either replace that. If you're on the job, you're going to replace that master cylinder. If you're in class with me, we're going to take it. We're going to clean it really good. Make sure there's no defects. We're going to put the correct type of lubricant on the seals. And we're essentially going to put that master cylinder back together. But that's because that's my decision. And we're on lab cars. On a customer car, even if it was me, I'd, I'd have to call and say, I went to do your booster and now it needs a master cylinder. And if I'm honest, I'm going to say it's my fault. And if I'm dishonest, I'm going to say, I couldn't believe it. When I got in there, I saw this was all so bad. But that's lying. You know, that, that's what that is, in case you didn't know. So discharge the vacuum. How? Um, well, the way I would do it, I would jump in and I'd pump the brake pedal several times until the brake pedal's hard. Then you know the vacuum's gone. Uh, the way that Bao did it on uh, last week on Thursday, that was pretty smart. I was looking and I was kind of nervous. He had pulled the check valve out. I'm sure quite a few people did that. If you pull the check valve out, you know there's no vacuum in there because the air rushed in. Either way, those are those are both fine, totally legitimate. Um, and then this talks about the um, a little bit more about the valve, a little bit more about the pressure disc. So so this just gets into the finer points of you know how it how it seats and and how it unseats. Sometimes maybe with a little bit excessive amount of detail. Um, and then generally speaking. All the brake boosters are going to work pretty much the same now, but they were a little bit more basic, and then they got a little bit more advanced when we started to get into some of the more things like VSC, vehicle stability control. So it's just some of the intricacies of how it seals, how it unseals. In the case that it's a VSC, we can actually use uh, some electronic control to uh, potentially even apply the brakes. This is not something that's real commonly used. So the second we want to get into, let's say, a vehicle with pre-collision uh, or you know, any car that's going to apply the brakes on its own, whether to avoid pedestrians or you know, if you're backing out of the driveway and it senses an object and it applies the brakes itself, it's, it's all some version of collision avoidance. We're going to abandon these. And I think that's more where Kenny was going when he, when he asked that question. Yes, cars still use these, but fewer and fewer because it's more and more difficult to really build up a lot of brake pressure without a person stepping on the pedal. Now, technically, this solenoid could actually open that valve, but there's better ways to do it. And so you're going to see less and less, right? And, and now this is a good image to study. This is the brake booster push rod that I was talking about with that uh, Nissan Frontier that applies the brakes on its own. This is what we got to 
adjust. So there will be a nut right here and you can actually unthread the nut to lengthen the push rod. There's a special procedure for that. I have a video I'm gonna share with you on exactly how to set that uh, length. And there's a couple, it, there's, a, there's a little bit of a, an image that'll help you understand it, but this is the SST. It's like basically an H with a pin in there. So what we're essentially gonna do, we're gonna go to the master cylinder, flip it this direction, set the distance right here. So it's just, just barely touching. And that's going to establish the distance we need to know. Then you're going to take it, and this is on the master cylinder. You're going to take it off the booster, off the master cylinder, I mean, bring it to the booster, and there's going to be either a gap right here or it's going to hit. If it hits and you can tell that it moved that pin, you need to shorten the, the rod. But if you bring it over here and there's a gap, you need to lengthen the rod. So this is just... It's the easiest thing. It's a little bit hard to, to show with pictures. And the detail that um, technicians forget a lot is it actually calls to have the gasket in place. So the master cylinder with the gasket using this special tool. I have a station for that. That's something I want everybody to do um, this week. All right, so this just kind of run through the process. You'll, you'll be ready. The other thing is on the pedal side, this is something that some people struggled with last week, when we go to remove the old booster, this lock nut is going to control where our pedal is, how much play there is in the pedal. And if, if you take one out and then you put a new one in and this one's in a different position, that's going to mess up your pedal free play. And like what some people were having, their um, brake lights were either staying on or not coming on until the brake pedal was very low. So so either of these, right, like this pedal push rod or, or this uh, master cylinder push rod, if that's too short, longer stopping distances, if it's too long, brakes self-apply. With this one, if it's too long, brake lights are going to be on all the time. And if it's too short, it's again going to be uh, delayed engagement. You're going to go to hit the pedal and the pedal is going to have to go lower to actually apply the brakes. And that's not good either. That's kind of the summary right here. That I gave you. So, and then the other thing I've mentioned was remember those those vehicles that uh, don't make good vacuum. So let's say it could be um, turbocharged or something with aggressive EVT, such as an Atkinson cycle. So in Toyota Land, we're dealing with Atkinson all the time. The A twenty five A that's in like Camry, Rav four, uh, Highlander. Uh, it, it's in just it's in a lot of stuff that's all atkinson cycle so at, without getting into the deeper technology of atkinson cycle the short version is we're hanging the intake valve and the exhaust valve open so long and so much overlap that it, the engine doesn't really build vacuum the engine's going to build very minimal vacuum if we don't build good vacuum we don't have a working brake booster so one way to deal with that is just is just walk away from the vacuum booster. And that probably is what I would have done. But that means going to the electronic booster and that's cost a lot more money. So what they've done is added the engine driven vacuum pump. So that may be driven by the camshaft or um, I mean, pretty much going to be driven by the camshaft or something by the engine, not likely to be driven by a belt, although it used to be back in the day. But going to be on the engine you may not even realize there's a vacuum pump there and we're doing that on the on the corollas and we're doing that all the time how we test it is the same but if you're actually trying to test health of the engine you know to see if there's low compression or maybe you have a bent valve or something you can't be measuring the vacuum pump you actually have to find a port that's manifold vacuum so for brakes not real critical for the semester you'll have me with engines, you got to know if you're measuring the vacuum pump or the actual pumping action of the engine. One tells you the health of the engine and one tells you the health of the vacuum pump. So pretty good. Um, and then as you see, um, some of the things that we're going to have to do, some of the potential failures, leaks, um, front or rear seals can, can leak, atmospheric pressure. So like 
one thing I'll tell you that's kind of cool is if we had, and I think what I could do is jump back to the picture that will show it a little bit better. If we had a bad diaphragm way back here, if we had this diaphragm right here, no good, if it had a hole in it, what's very interesting, when you step on the brakes, air rushes in, and if there's a hole, that air will rush through the hole in the diaphragm and into the engine. What do you think the engine's going to do? Oh, the engine stumbles and starts to run lean every time you step on the brake pedal. That would actually be a pretty good indication that there's a hole in the diaphragm in the brake booster. So now this is where you get brakes are overlapping with engine performance. We've had vehicles that set engine lean codes due to a bad brake booster, and they're hard to duplicate because the technician never thinks to test it when stepping on the brake booster. They're just running it in the bay. The leak is only there when you step on the brakes because it's a hole in the diaphragm. Tricky stuff. Um, and so we could do quite a number of tests. This is going to summarize some of the um, checks that you know we could do. So like, for example, seeing if it holds running it, um, see even it functions, running it, shutting it off, waiting 10 minutes, I would probably go with three, right? And then when you reapply it, you should feel good assist and, and uh, maybe even hear, hear it. Um, now, that summary, let's jump in Hydro Boost. Hydro Boost, this was one where I showed you, but it's tough to explain the, the operation. Engine runs, turns the belt. Belt turns the power steering pump. Power steering pump pumps the fluid to the, not only to the steering box, but, but also to the hydro boost, right? Now the hydro boost is going to take that fluid, manipulate it to actually push a piston into the master cylinder. Then of course, it's also got to go to the steering gear, which in the one I showed you was a steering rack and this is steering box. And that's something we'll cover later too. But there's your overall look. Uh, they may call it hydraulic power assist, but generally they're just going to go with the trade name, which is the Hydra Boost. So he, here's some of the things that are happening. When it's on applied, the spool valve, there's a valve that controls what the fluid does, is in its neutral position, and basically it's just building up pressure inside the accumulator. Then when you apply the pedal, the spool valve is going to move, as you can see, and pressurized power steering fluid is going to be applied to the lever, which is attached to the power piston. So if we apply this to the lever, this lever is actually going to go ahead and, and move this rod and start pushing on that output rod. That's going to push the brake boost, the, the master cylinder really hard. All right. And then we'll jump back. And if you're holding it, it's essentially just going to go into uh, a position of maintaining, just maintaining. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to bypass the actuation, but it's still going to stay there and maintain it. So look at that, at how that actually functions. Um, right here, we are just at idle. Pump pressure is coming in, not really doing much, going to the steering gear, but also potentially charging up that accumulator. Remember that accumulator is basically a piston we pump into the piston and the piston's gonna just store it for later. So it's like, let me just build up my pressure and then if the engine dies, I've got all this stored pressure so that I can help apply the brake several times with the engine dead. It's kind of the same as the check valve, right? Then let's say we apply it. Now we're actually gonna send fluid down here to have it do work and it's gonna push really hard to the left. And look what happens when it pushes that piston. I guess it didn't show it real well, but when it pushes that piston, that's going to go to the output rod. That's actually what's pushing on the master cylinder itself. And then same when we hold it, it's, it's not actuating the, 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 the lever. Like this is actuating the lever. Instead, it's really just holding it. So the, once again, the good news on this is you don't need to know in detail, you know, what you know, what part, is it the spool valve? Is it something to do with the, the pressure chamber? Is it the, is it the internal lever? 
or the piston. Basically, you need to know if it's in the Hydra Boost or not in the Hydra Boost. And to be very honest with you, mostly what fails on these are the seals. So if we have a leak and you see power steering fluid leaking out, that would that would require a replacement of the Hydra Boost. We don't rebuild these. We don't really do much service. Um, there was a time where the accumulators were going bad and we were replacing accumulators, but it was pretty short lived. If you have a problem with a leaking accumulator, you're, you're, you're going to generally replace it. Um, what's interesting is the accumulator uses nitrogen gas. So we have nitrogen gas in there. The fluid pressure is going to push on a piston, which is going to push on the nitrogen gas. And then when we lose power steering because the engine dies or something, the nitrogen gas, because it's pressurized to a PSI, it's actually going to push back on that piston, which is going to repressurize the power steering. So it's it's uh, essentially, if it was electrical, this would be uh, this would be a capacitor, all right. But because it's mechanical and it's fluid and it's hydraulics, it's it's we just call it an accumulator. All right. So it functions essentially the same. Um, and then the main part with the diagnosis, like I'd mentioned is the power steering pump working or not? And if the power steering pump's not working, it's gonna affect both your steering and your brakes. Whereas, you know, if the power steering pump is working and your steering's working well, but your brake pedal is firm and you're not getting assist, well, that's when you're probably gonna be looking at a hydro boost type of problem. It's, it's not real difficult to understand these. And then just thing to remember, missing belt, low fluid, those are going to cause some issues. Maybe even a line restriction, but um, not super common. Um, and then let's just say that we were to um, have to do some, some troubleshooting. There are actual tools for this. So um, I, think I, I think I did have them, but uh, I don't remember if I have them right now. There's a power steering pressure uh gauge set let me look on my cheat sheet here because now i can't see both screens it's so sad and you can feel bad but it doesn't matter yeah it looks like i must have i must have cut it but but basically there there is a power steering pressure uh gauge set just like just like brake pressure you'd actually hook it up to the power steering pump you'd start it and you'd see how much pressure does the power steering pump make it's not real likely you're going to need to do that for Hydro Boost, but we will cover that more in the steering system. Right, so real difficult here. Um, and so we discussed some of these um, potential failures, leaks in the booster, worn out pump, problem with the drive belt, badly contaminated power steering fluid, but it has to be like really bad, or maybe even leaky hoses. And so the way we did the function test on the, um, Brake booster, you remember, we pump the pedal with the engine off, it should be firm. We start the engine, we should feel a drop. Agreed? Guess what? Same with the Hydra Boost. You pump the engine, you pump the pedal. Now it may take up to 40 applications, by the way, before it firms up because that accumulator stores a lot of pressure. The brake pedal's firm, we start the engine. What do you think is going to happen? We should become Olga, right? but not because the engine's running and making vacuum, but because the engine's running, turning the belt, turning the power steering pump, which is making power steering pressure. Same, same deal, no biggie. Now, and one of the other things this is gonna uh, cover as well is if you were curious if that, um, if you wanted to test to see if that accumulator is holding pressure, we test it the same way. Think of how we test the check valve and the, and the air tightness check. We're going to run it. We're going to shut it off. We're going to wait a certain amount of time. And we're going to jump in and see if it still has some assist. Same exact thing. If that accumulator is holding pressure, we should be able to jump in it and we should get assist. But not only two or three times, it should be like, like a bunch of times. Like sometimes it can literally take up to 40 applications to completely discharge that accumulator. And then just a servicing note, if you're going to work on one of these, you don't want that accumulator charged up. So if you're going to work on it, service information will tell you, get in and pump the pedal, pump the pedal, pump the pedal, pump the pedal 40 times or something before you open up a line 
and that's just to discharge the accumulator. And that's going to be kind of similar with this last one here, which is the power booster, which is electrohydraulic. So let's make a let's make a definition here. Electrohydraulic is like electric and hydraulic. It's given that the brake system's hydraulic, so a lot of times I'll just call it the electric booster or the electronic booster. But I'm not really being proper. I'm not proper most of the time, so this is nothing new. But it's electric over hydraulic. The electric motor pressurizes the hydraulic system. So, so the other thing they could call it is electric over hydraulic. Um, that would be true. Different than electromechanical. Electromechanical would be more like a solenoid. The electric moves the mechanical. It makes a physical movement. This is electrohydraulic. All right, cool. So it's it's pretty much testing it is going to be um, very similar. Here's what it looks like in Toyota land. So like, for example, we've got the accumulator over here. It's a lot like a hydro boost accumulator, except it doesn't store power, power steering fluid. It's, it's just brake fluid specifically. Um, we've got a pump and a motor. And so the pump and motor are separate because the motor is the electrical turning, 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 turning. A, a motor doesn't pump. So basically the, the motor turns the pump and the pump actually builds the pressure. So it, it is a pump and motor together, but there's really two parts there, right? And then we have several solenoids and those are switching. They, they, can, they can allow you to apply the brakes, not apply the brakes, build brake pressure, release brake pressure, et cetera maybe even up to uh, eight control solenoids, an accumulator pressure sensor. So this knows what your pressure is. If, if your accumulator pressure is kind of like getting low, lower than it should be, what do you think it's gonna do? Hmm. Oh, I know. It'll run the pump and motor and the pump and motor will build the brake pressure back up so the accumulator is fully charged, at which case, to be honest with you, this system doesn't even need you. I mean, this system can run that pump and motor. And if it so chooses, it can open up some of these solenoid valves and apply the brakes with or without you. You could be snoozing in the driver's seat. You could be snoozing in the passenger seat and there is no driver. This has the potential to function without you. And that's why to me, this is where I see the future going because not only because of fully autonomous, but a lot of those things we discussed, some form of collision avoidance, right? If, if as we look over here, we've got the skid control ECU, that's basically your ABS module. If that skid control ECU is on your CAN network and your CAN network also has your, you know, body control module and it's communicating with whatever module is going to look at your forward facing camera, if your forward-facing camera module sees a pedestrian, it can send out a signal on the CAN network saying, oh crap, somebody dropped their basketball and it bounced out. Remember the picture, right? It bounced out and it says, brakes don't fail me now. Well, we can go above and beyond that. Oh crap, there's a pedestrian. Then your skid control ECU can say, oh, well, based on my programming from my manufacturer, if there's a pedestrian, what I'm to do is run the pump and motor, utilize the accumulator pressure that was already there from before, and open up these valves and apply the brakes myself. And then also your body control module is going to apply the brake lights. Even though your brake switch never closes, your body control module controls the brake lights anyway. So it just bypasses you when you're drunk. I mean, sleeping, I mean, whatever, right? So it doesn't, it hardly needs you. Now we still have a lot of work to do. Don't get me wrong. But this system, it, to me, has the capability to bring us there. Now, if you were on Oprah and you were like, oh, these systems are, are they're computer controlled. And they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's so unsafe. Just like way back in the day when Toyotas were allegedly accelerating by themselves. The whole thing was, was, due to people stacking multiple uh, floor mats. 
So I own some of that because they shortened the pedal just to make up for, but, but also they did a reprogram by the way, where if you have brake and accelerator pedal, basically the brake pedal wins. It just pulls the accelerator to zero. So they did a good thing, but in reality, it was kind of like, it was mostly operator error. And on the news and on these channels where people saying the car accelerated on its own, I'm traumatized. And then they're saying, oh, well, this brake system can apply its own brakes instantly. The same type of people are going, nope, 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 it's unsafe. You may have double, triple redundancies. And by the way, these people are flying in airplanes. Airplanes, they're mostly autonomous as well. And you're controlling things, but not directly. There's no mechanical connection between the pilot's controls and actually what's happening at the wings of the engine. It's electronic. It's a sensor on a wire to a module on a wire to an actuator. We'll cover that a little bit more later. But because this is automotive and people go on Oprah and say that, you know, it's Toyota's fault and they want all their money, they're going to make a mechanical backup. So when you apply the pedal, you're, you're pushing this operating rod. This operating rod has the ability to actually in a lot of cases, although maybe not this particular design, in a lot of cases, it will actually go through to the master cylinder. So this master cylinder is still here. So in the case of failure, your operating rod still pushes on the master cylinder. Cool. So you have all this in one. That's the positive. I, I hyped you up on the positive. Here's the negative. Let's say you have a bad primary cup seal on the master cylinder. Well, you get the whole assembly, skid control, ECU, pump and motor, reservoir, everything. And, and that's the, now the negative. So it's a great system, but the parts aren't available independently. You're getting the whole assembly. So if you're going to replace one of these, you better be right. You had better be right. Um, so a little bit tricky, but it's a good system. And now here's what it kind of looks like. The reservoir holds the, holds the brake fluid. The reservoir fills the chambers in the master cylinder, but it also feeds the pump. And so that's why what's weird is if you're working on some of these systems, you'll look and like the brake fluid level can really vary a lot because it depends on how much brake fluids in the accumulator, how much the pump is pulling. The other thing that we've seen is if, if you look and it's kind of low and you fill it up and then for whatever reason, the accumulator discharges, Especially like if we're going to work on it, they'll, it'll like, they'll call it the zero down procedure or something. You can click on tech stream and say basically discharge the accumulator. All of a sudden your brake fluid will be at the top if not overflowing. So in the range is, is good, but there's a specific way to check that fluid and it has to do with how much fluid's in the accumulator. It's just a lot of volume there. Um, and then basically the, the pump and slash accumulator can look they bypass those pistons and they can apply the pistons themselves see that that's that's the big difference you can apply the pistons with your pedal or the pump and the accumulator can apply those pistons with their own fluid pressure and you're snoozing and you're losing so it's a it's a great system um and this just gets into a little bit more of exactly where the ports are but overall if you understand this you're right where you should be. Cool. So then talks about A's and B's and, and sometimes they'll give you a, an e-learning course and they'll be like, oh, chamber A and chamber B and chamber. Trust me. If you understand what I said, you're good. All right. And then it, it does have ways to reduce pressure as well. So, and, and that part is really ABS. So I'm going to hold that for ABS because we're going to cover that. Now, if it has a malfunction, there is a safety mechanism where this piston will bump into this piston, just like your normal master cylinder. So they've, they've thought it through very well. If you're going to check it, to check the fluid level, turn the ignition off and pump the brake pedal 40 times. Sometimes you can do an active test to get it ready to check the fluid level. If you're going to bleed it, a lot of times you'll need to do um, ABS bleed, which is more like you go in the tech tech stream, go to utility, you go to air bleeding or something. It can vary from uh, model to model. But, but basically, you're going to bleed it at each wheel as you would with a non-ABS. 
and then the accumulator is going to pr provide the necessary fluid to the rear brakes continuously, but from one model to the next can be slightly different. So this isn't a universal instruction. This is like you follow service information specifically, and then a lot of times it'll actually run you through a full-on utility. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, and that's why this is saying DLC, TechStream, Active Test, and uh, sometimes if it's just the more basic system, you just really have to activate the solenoid. Um, like for example, track solenoid and SRMF and SRMR, you may have to activate each of these independently and bleed it, or sometimes you can activate them all and bleed it. But again, you're following service information specifically. Um, and so it's, and, and also, if service information says don't depress the brake pedal, just click activate on the scan tool, follow the steps, because it may not necessarily need it. Remember when we go back here? Back here, you need Tony to step on the brake pedal, except no, you don't. It can use the pump motor and the solenoid, and it can apply the brake fluid pressure without you stepping on it. So again, follow the, follow the procedure specifically. And now this jumps into if we had to do some diagnosis or do the similar types of things, brake pedal height, free play, travel, those, those would be specs we can compare. Um, free play, for example, that's basically the little wiggle. When, when you move the, if you grab the pedal and you just wiggle it lightly, that's just a little bit of, of uh, free play. That's, that's just, it should be pretty minimal. So that's what it means by it's between the brake pedal linkage and the master cylinder piston. That linkage is going to move a little bit. It's going to touch the master cylinder piston. That doesn't take a lot of force. It's just a tiny wiggle. And so that's what's saying. Very light hand pressure the pedal. Measure how far it moves. When we pulled brake boosters out and people had the adjustments all messed up on that brake pedal push rod, if your push rod is too tight, your master cylinder will have no play. There'll be no wiggle. And that's a lot of times when the brake lights are stuck on. And if you really have it out, that's when you'll release the pedal. But the problem is your push rod will be so long, your pedal will be released. Your push rod will bottom out, but it's so long, it's still pressing the master cylinder. That's how you know you screwed up. So it's free play. And then sometimes like the brake pedal travel, that's actually talking about from, from released to actually apply down to the floor. I would rather measure from the floor to the pedal applied, but a lot of times the spec is from released to, to as basically they'll say apply 40 pounds of pressure and see how low it goes. And it may say you should have three inches of brake pedal travel. If you have four, you have extra brake pedal travel. You got to think, is it maybe a, is it maybe a, air in the system is it maybe your brake booster is not getting enough vacuum supply is it you know the answer would be that'd be more like air in the system air in the system will give you a low pedal a pedal low to the ground but there's some brake adjustments that can as well so consider those excessive pedal travel is not good a high firm pedal would be would be good right and then the reserve pedal is more from the floor to the pedal that's what i like to measure but that's not always what the spec is, as I said. Um, and this kind of runs through. So you're going to actually measure, you're just going to wiggle this a little bit, see how many, you know, sixteenths or quarter of an inch or millimeters it's going to be in. Compare that. And you can snug that up with the brake pedal push rod. And then, uh, for example, this one is more like the pedal, pedal uh, reserve. Or... If you're measuring it from full height, let's say that this pedal is not applied. In fact, that was wrong. This pedal is not applied. You measure, let's say, uh, four inches. Then you mash the pedal, and now you measure two inches. That would be two inches of pedal travel. Or you could call it two inches of reserve pedal just because it's two inches off the, off the ground. Does that make sense? So off the carpet is reserve. It's like how much you have in reserve. Travel is where you actually do the full stroke. You measure that. All right. And then, and that's kind of like 
the summary of, of what you got. Now, if we have a problem where the brakes are dragging, the brake pedal's harder than normal, the brake pedal height has changed, the engine operation changes when you apply the pedal, like it, it, it stumbles or it, the idle changes. This is when we might have to really look into our brake booster system. We don't just do it because, we don't just do it because we're bored. Um, and basically the tandem booster is about the same. And, and overall, the hydro booster is gonna be pretty similar and the electronic booster is gonna be pretty similar as well. And so some of the tests we may have to do. Um, the other thing to consider is if someone has done work on the system and they didn't know, you know, how to do the measurements and how to set the, the let's say the, the pedal travel, like some of us, we, we were rushed last week. So we're going to go back to those cars and get our measurements fine tuned. So if somebody has done work in the work history, that's another reason why you may want or need to check, you know, some of those adjustments. And uh, so that's kind of, you know, what this is about. It's this again, just going through some of those measurements that I want you guys to perform in labs. So you can always follow those skill drills in lab. And now this is going to talk about if you failed a, a brake booster function check, you're going to pull the hose off, you're going to hook the gauge up, and then you actually measure how much vacuum's making it. That's something you should be pretty familiar with. And we're just really reviewing what you've done. And if you haven't done it, reminding you that you got to get this done. Um, and then we might have to actually inspect the engine performance. So let's say that this was um, a vacuum booster. We may see, is the engine misfiring? Is it running right? If it's a hydro boost system, we may actually have to look at power steering level. We may look and find a belt is broken, right? So we don't just jump to the brake components. We may have to look a little more holistically at how's the engine running? How is the belt? Um, you know, if it's a brake booster type, uh, if it's an electronic booster type, one of the things we're going to do pretty early on is check for codes, check for DTCs. Like, for example, this has a vacuum line that's got a cut in it. So that's going to give us some trouble. Um, this hydro boost one, this is more showing like these are where each of the lines go. So if we have a problem with one of these lines, you know, you could see how it affects it. So if it leaves the power steering pump, and let's just say this line, um, is leaking a lot of fluid, that's going to affect not only the hydro boost, but as you can see later down the road, it's going to affect the rack or the steering gear. So just considering those, ah, I, I knew I had it. I just couldn't remember where, my fault. This is a gauge hooked up to the power steering hose to actually measure how much pressure the pump makes. That's pretty rare to do, but if you really had to, you could. Luckily for you, Toyota doesn't use hydro boosts. <laughs> and so this is mostly visual inspection, um, looking for leaks, checking the pressures. You can see there's off, there's running. So this thing's making, mm, looks about uh, 600 PSI. It'd be good for a power steering system. So not real, uh, not real super crazy. So at this point, I'm going to set up that Kahoot. And you guys be ready for the lecture quiz. So let me have a have a look here, see if there's any questions. Very good. 